Hey everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to talk about derivatives and the shapes of curves. This section is rather a lengthy section that covers several different topics. So this will be divided up into several videos. But we have seen previously that the signs of the first and second derivatives influence the shape of the graph of a function f of x. This section is going to discuss how can we use these facts that give us an indication of why the derivative, the sign of the derivative, determines the shape of the original graph. And we're going to use them along with the differentiation rules to explain the shapes of various functions graph, graphs. So in this first video, we're going to cover the first two objectives. State and explain how the mean value theorem connects the derivative of a function with the graph of a function. And apply the mean value theorem to velocity problems, including problems where the theorem must be applied to a difference of functions. We'll cover the next objectives in the other remaining videos. So this video is going to talk a lot about what's called the mean value theorem. So we're going to start with a question that kind of gets to the heart of what the mean value theorem is stating. If you have two functions that have, that have identical derivatives over an interval, how are those functions related other than they have identical derivatives? We can actually use the mean value theorem to answer this question. So before we get to the mean value theorem, we're going to um, discuss a special case of the mean value theorem called Rolle's theorem. So in the next graph on the, on the following page, when we get to it, it's suggesting that if a differentiable function crosses a horizontal line at different points, then there's at least one point between them where the tangent to the graph is horizontal, which means the derivative is zero. So Rolle's theorem, this is what the Rolle's theorem states. You have a function that is continuous at every point on a closed interval a to b. And the function is also differentiable at every point of the interior, the open interval a to b. So continuous on the closed interval a, b, differentiable on the open interval a, b. So that means differentiable means there are no cusp no corners, no vertical tangent lines, no places where the derivative does not exist on the interior A to B. So those are the hypotheses of, the, of Rolle's theorem. If f of A equals f of B, so the y value at A equals the y value at B, Rolle's theorem says there is at least one number x equals C in this interval where the derivative is zero which means you have a horizontal tangent line at this x equals c. So here's what Rolle's theorem states in terms of a graph. So the graph in the top left corner is um, a function. Let's call it y equals f of x. The function is continuous on the closed interval a to b. It's definitely continuous between these, between x equals a and x equals b. And the function's definitely differentiable. There are no cusps, no corners, no vertical tangent lines on the open interval a, b. And I notice that f of a equals f of b. So the y values are equal to each other on some closed interval. Rolle's theorem states there's at least one value of x, where they're calling it x equals c in the theorem, where the derivative at c is zero. So you have a horizontal tangent line at x equals c. which means f prime of c equals zero. Oh, at x equals c. 
So that's the simplest Rolle's theorem can be. If you have the y values are equal, the function is continuous on the closed interval, differentiable on the open inter interval, there is at least one x value between a and b where you have a horizontal tangent line, which means the graph has to, well, the graph could be either increasing. If I have to get, if I want to get back down to this other point on the graph, I have to turn back around. And that turning point is where you have a horizontal tangent line. If the graph was decreasing first after x equals a, I have to still turn around to get back to the same y value. So where you have a turning point is where you have, you have a horizontal tangent line. But keep in mind that Rolle's theorem states there's at least one value between a and b. So in this case, the function is still continuous on the closed interval a to b. It's still differentiable on the open interval a to b. It looks like I could turn around several times until I get back to down to f of b, the same y value. So f of a equals f of b. It looks like I could have three turning points, three horizontal tangent lines. I have at least one according to Rolle's theorem. So it looks like I have three in this case. But you could have the graph turn an infinite number of times. As long as the y values are equal, I have to turn around to get back down to f of b. So those are two cases where Rolle's theorem can be applied, um, where the hypotheses are true. These next three are where the hypotheses of Rolle's theorem are not true, and you cannot use Rolle's theorem. So in this first graph, y equals f of x, it's not, the function's not continuous on the closed interval a to b. It's not continuous at x equals a. There's a removable, removable discontinuity at x equals a. So even though f of a equals f of b, you cannot use Rolle's theorem. Rolle's theorem says you would have at least one horizontal tangent line. Well, you don't here. It's because this graph was not continuous. Same thing for the next graph. If this is y equals f of x, it's also not, con the function's not continuous on closed interval a to b. It's f of a equals f of a, or f of a equals f of b again. So that, that condition of Rolle's theorem is true, but it does not mean you have a horizontal, horizontal tangent line because the hypotheses are not true for Rolle's theorem to apply. The graph has a jump discontinuity at some interior point of AB. So no horizontal, horizontal tangent line. And the last case that we haven't talked about yet, this time the function is continuous on AB. What's the other condition that needs to be true? Because F of A does equal F of B here. But I don't see any horizontal tangent line. So what condition's not being satisfied? Right, the function is not differentiable on the open interval a to b. I see a place between x equals a and x equals b, x sub zero or x naught, where there's a cusp. F prime of x naught does not exist. So the derivative does not exist at a cusp. So those are three cases where the hypotheses of Rolle's theorem are essential. The function must be continuous on the closed interval. The function must be differentiable on the open interval. And the y values must be equal to each other at some interval of the graph. So here's how we can use Rolle's theorem. So example one, show that this equation, x cubed plus 3x plus 1 equals 0, has exactly one real solution. 
using the intermediate value theorem that we've talked about before, and now use Rolle's theorem as well. All right, so let's start off by using the intermediate value theorem. So if you remember the intermediate value theorem, you must have a function. So make sure the equation is equal to zero first. Then one side, the other side that's not zero is your function. So let f of x equal x cubed plus 3x plus 1. This function is a polynomial function. So it is continuous for all real numbers. And we also know polynomial functions do not have any cusp or corners or vertical tangent lines. So, um, and differentiable. on the open interval negative infinity to infinity. So this is the most, this is the best case scenario. If you have a polynomial function, we automatically know it's continuous. We automatically know it's differentiable. So those two hypotheses of Rolle's theorem are already satisfied. All right, still using the, interme the intermediate value theorem though. If you remember the intermediate value theorem from earlier in the class, we need to find um, a closed interval where one y value is greater than zero and the other y value is less than zero. So let's choose an interval. It doesn't matter which interval you choose as long as one y value is positive and the other y value is negative at the endpoints. So let's choose the closed interval negative one to one. If you want to use negative 3 to 8, you can, as long as the y values are opposite signs. So now test the y values at the endpoints. If you substitute a negative 1, you're going to find out that f of negative 1 is negative 3. So we are below the x-axis at x equals negative 1. On the other hand, f of 1 is positive 5. So we are above the x-axis at x equals positive 1. If the function is continuous and I'm below the x-axis and then I'm above the x-axis on some closed interval between negative 1 and 1, the intermediate value theorem says I must cross the x-axis at least once. So by the intermediate value theorem, there exist at least x equals c between x equals negative 1 and x equals positive 1, where f of c equals 0. So that means I have at least one solution to this equation, at least one. And the solution would be at x equals c, at least one value between negative 1 and 1. But we're not finished with the problem. Intermediate value theorem says we have at least one solution, one real solution. Now we can combine it with Rolle's theorem to show that we have exactly one real solution to this equation without actually finding the solution. So I provi I've provided the graph, but we don't need the graph to understand what's happening with the function. So. To use Rolle's theorem on the closed interval negative 1 to 1, we're going to make an assumption. Assume that there are two real zeros on closed interval negative 1 to 1.
we'll call them x equals a and x equals b. So that means f of a equals 0, f of b equals 0. So we're making, an we're making an assumption that we know that we have at least one real zero. Let's make the assumption we have two. And we're going to argue using Rolle's theorem that this cannot happen. You cannot have two, which means you would have exactly one real zero instead of having more than one. So now Rolle's theorem. The function is continuous on all real numbers. We've already checked that. And the function was differentiable for all real numbers. We've checked that as well. So those two hypotheses of Rolle's theorem are true. And notice that f of a equals f of b because those are the x-intercepts. So they automatically have the same y value. Now, you might be looking at the graph and thinking, how can you have two x-intercepts when the graph only shows there's one between x equals negative 1 and x equals 1? That's what we're trying to show using Rolle's theorem, that you can't have two x-intercepts, which means the graph will only have one, and then we'll be done. So notice that the y values are the same. Rolle's theorem... states that there exist x equals c between x equals a and x equals b because they share the same y value where the derivative at c is 0. So in other words, there's, if these are the two x-intercepts and their y values are both equal to zero, then there must be at least one place between the two x-intercepts where you have a horizontal tangent line. At least one place. Well, obviously with the graph we don't, but let's see why not. Let's find out where would the horizontal tangent lines actually be. So take the derivative of the function now. The derivative was or the function is x cubed plus 3x plus 1, so the derivative is 3x squared plus 3. If we want to find the critical number, you set it equal to 0, because the function, or the derivative will not, the derivative will be defined because it's differentiable on that closed interval. So the derivative is 3x squared plus 3. If you solve, you might want to factor out the 3, divide both sides by 3, and you're going to quickly notice that you have x squared equals negative 1. There are no real solutions to this equation. Which means we are trying to find the critical numbers. f of x has no critical numbers. None. So let's trace back our logic. Rolle's theorem said you must have at least one critical number between a and x equals a and x equals b because they share the same y value, the x-intercept. The y value was zero. On the other hand, Rolle's theorem said you can't, you must have an x, you must have a horizontal tangent line. But when we do the work, when we calculate the derivative and solve, there is no critical number. That means the original assumption we made was false. So we assumed there were two real zeros. That was a false assumption because it leads to a contradiction. We do the work, there's no critical number. But Rolle's theorem says if you assume there are two x-intercepts, there must be a horizontal tangent line, and you must have a critical number. Well, that assumption's false. So Rolle's theorem implies there must be exactly one uh, real zero to the equation x cubed 
plus 3x plus 1 equals 0. And that's what we were asked to show. We were, show, we were asked to show there is exactly one real zero. So if there was a zero here, if there was a real zero here and also at other, some other place, I would have to pat, I would have to either increase and come back down, which means I have to have a turning point. And um, if Rolls theorem has tell or the work that we did, shows that there are no critical numbers, the graph does not turn around. The graph is increasing only. So that was an application of Rolle's theorem. Now let's go back to the main theorem that we were talking about at the beginning of the section, the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem has been known since about 1850s through the 1880s. Um, it was first stated by Joseph Louis Lagrange He's a very famous mathematician within calculus and algebra. And he noticed that the mean value theorem is essentially a slanted version of Rolle's theorem. And this is what it states. We're going to, I'm going to illustrate this, what mean value theorem says with the two diagrams, and then we're going to state the theorem. So the mean value theorem says this. Let's say you have a curve that passes through a comma f of a and b comma f of b, the function is continuous. On the closed interval a to b. And the function is differentiable, just like with Rolle's theorem, the same conditions, differentiable on the open interval a b. All right, so if those two conditions are true, then we can do this. Take the two points at the endpoints, A and B, connect them with a straight line, and we've seen this story before. This is called a secant line when you connect the two points at an end, or on the endpoints of a, on a curve. Calculate the slope of the secant line. That would be the standard slope formula, f of b, subtract f of a, divided by b minus a. What the diagram is illustrating is that the slope of this secant line is going to happen in terms of the slope of the tangent line at least one place. So, if you have the slope of the secant line is m, then somewhere between these two points on your curve, f of x, the slope of the tangent line will equal the slope of the secant line. And it's illustrating in the diagram that your derivative at c is the slope of the tangent line at c. And these must be equal to each other. The slope of the tangent line equals the slope of the secant line at least one point between x equals a and x equals b. So f prime of c must equal this slope m at least one time. The tangent line and the secant line are parallel to each other. In terms of the other diagram, the mean value theorem, as we're going to state it in the second, says you have at least one location where the tangent line slope is equal to the secant line slope, at least one place. So in this diagram, or this graph, it's showing you to connect these points A and B, so the slope of the secant line, we'll call M again. The slope of the secant line is attained at least one time between x equals a and x equals b. And it's illustrating in the diagram of this graph that you could have the slope of the secant line attained two times or more. The derivative at c1 is the slope of the secant line, they're the same and at C2, the slope is the same. So the slope of the tangent line 
is equal to the slope of the secant line at two different x values. Okay, so with these two graphs in mind, let's state the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem says the function must be differentiable on the interval a to b. Then there is, there exists, a number x equals c between a and b, so just like we were talking about with the graphs, such that the left side of this formula or this statement is the slope of the tangent line. at x equals c. So you have at least one of these values x equals c where the slope of the tangent line is equal to the slope of the secant line. Where the secant line connects the endpoints of your interval from x equals a to x equals b. And this last statement, it, you get it by just multiplying both sides of this equation by b minus a, or this formula by b, by b minus a. But the one that's boxed, this is a more common version of the mean value theorem. Okay, so let's finish up this video with an illustration of how the mean value theorem can be applied in terms of velocity. So this is, a, this is actually a very, very relevant concept involving the mean value theorem. Suppose that you have two stationary patrol cars and they are equipped with a radar um, and they are five miles apart on a highway. So patrol car number one, patrol car number two, and they are five miles apart. A truck passes the first patrol car and its speed is 55 miles per hour. And four minutes later, so 55 miles per hour, we've used five, mi five miles per hour apart on the highway, we've used four minutes later, the truck passes the second patrol car and it's clocked in at 50 miles per hour. Prove that the truck must have exceeded the speed limit, which is 55 miles per hour, at some time during those four minutes. So this seems like how can the patrol and this truck would be pulled over by the way, how can this truck be pulled over if they were not speeding at the first patrol car, they were going exactly the speed limit, and they were not speeding at the second patrol car, but how can you prove that they did exceed the speed limit sometime between them, between the patrol cars? Here's the idea. We're going to let S of T be the distance from patrol car number one, patrol car number one, and the truck in miles. and t is going to be measured in hours because we're talking about speed in miles per hour where t is in hours. Okay, so let's calculate, let's actually start using the function. So no time has passed. We're going to assume that's when they, the truck passed the first patrol car. So no distance between the truck and the patrol car at no time has passed. Okay, now 
We cannot substitute in 4 because t is measured in hours. 4 is representing minutes. So 4 minutes needs to be converted to hours. So 4 sixtieths of an hour, which is 1 fifteenth of an hour. The distance between the truck and the first patrol car would be 5 miles when the truck passes the second patrol car. Okay, so if you remember way back earlier in the class, we discussed average speed or average velocity. Let's calculate the average velocity of the truck between those two moments in time. So keep in mind, average velocity corresponds to slope of the secant line of a curve that represents the position function. The slope would be s of 1 15, subtract s of 0, divided by 1 15, subtract 0. The position of the truck, 1 15th of an hour, was 5 miles. Position at 0 was 0, divided by 1 15th. And you're going to find out this is 75. And the units, the numerator was in miles, the denominator is in hours. So this is miles per hour. Now keep in mind what we just found. This is talking about the average speed or average velocity of the truck for that entire trip. So the speed of the truck was 55 miles per hour and then 50 miles per hour. But on average, during this entire five mile span, the truck was going 75 miles per hour on average. So let's think about this logically. If the truck is going on average 75 miles per hour, there probably was some times where the truck was going faster than 75 miles per hour. And also sometimes it might have gone less than 75 miles per hour. But on average, it was going 75 miles per hour. This is where the mean value theorem comes in. Mean value theorem just summarizes what we just said in logical terms. The slope of the tangent line which would be velocity, the derivative of s of t is velocity, and I'm going to call it c because c, the mean value theorem says c is somewhere between your endpoints, and we're using the endpoint 0 and uh, 1 15th of an hour, must equal 75 miles per hour for some t equals c between t equals 0 and t equal and t equals 1 15th hours so in other words if this is the average speed of the truck the mean value theorem says your speed must have been 75 at least one time so the derivative of position is velocity and the velocity of the truck is 75 miles per hour at least one time so yes the truck would be pulled over because they were speeding at least one time at one instant between the two patrol cars so this gives you an application of how the mean value theorem can be applied and it is applied in daily life it could be, it might not be patrol cars, it might be cameras that have a motion sensor or a, a, a radar detector. It might clock you in at one speed, two miles down the road it might clock you in at a different speed and you are not speeding at either end, but they have time stamps on the radar and they'll, pull, they'll give you a ticket in the mail because you were speeding. So if you have any questions about Rolle's theorem or the mean value theorem and how we applied it in the first two examples, please let me know. And as you work through the homework that involves the Rolle's theorem or the mean value theorem, and if you have any questions, please let me know that as well. And we will continue 
this topic on derivatives and the shapes of curves with the next video involving increasing and decreasing intervals and the first derivative.